that are base three reciprocals on the cube in mirror image positions. And when you do that, the whole first verse lines up with itself. Letters that are colored the same are either the same letters or in the same symmetry group. And what you'll notice about that pattern is it's extremely symmetrical. All letters are accounted for. And it's such a, pa a strong pattern that if any one letter were to have been lost or mistranscribed over the centuries, it could be uniquely replaced or corrected by reference only to the other letters in the same verse. And that's true as you go through the text. Approximately one letter can, can be corrected for each verse. At least that's my, my guess at this point. The presence of an error correcting pattern is tantamount to a demonstration that there's information. It's real hard to correct something that doesn't have any meaning. It's just don't go anyplace doing that. Well, what is this? Well, first, the reason I started it here rather than on the edge someplace is because I realized this was on the surface of a donut, which one could pull through. And I didn't want these lines to cross over in funny ways, so I simply rotated it through itself. But if it were on the surface of a donut, then that would all work as one, one unit. And so that's what the first verse of Genesis draws. It draws a kind of donut called a two-torus, a two-dimensional surface on a torus. As a matter of fact, one can curl it up like this. Now remember, when you get up to the top here, it's as if you went through and started out at the bottom again. This is as if this is on the surface of a donut. I made it look like a Cheops pyramid for a couple of reasons. If you have a cyclical pattern, and it has eight-fold symmetry and seven turns, then there's a measure angle that goes along with a function like that in mathematics called the argon pole angle. And it turns out to be the, I think it's the eighth root of seven. It might be the seventh root of eight, I forget now. And that turns out to turn out to be the tangent of the Cheops pyramid angle. Cheops pyramid, by the way, is also called mirror. And before the Muslims took the casing stones off to build the mosque of Cairo about seven or eight hundred years ago, there were supposed to have been seven colored bands with writing painted on them on the side of the pyramid. No one knows what that looked like. But that's kind of suspicious. Now, there's seven, seven bands there, and that's kind of interesting because seven's a real important number in the religious world. But in the mathematical world, it's important too. Donuts intrinsically have seven colored regions on them. Turns out that if you want to make a map, and you want adjacent countries to be different colors, and you make your map on the surface of a table or a, swe a sphere, then you only need four different colors so that the adjacent colors, the adjacent countries are different colors. If it's on a Mobius strip, a band with a half twist in it, you need six colors. On a donut, you need seven colors. You never need more, you can't get by with less. And they're always on the same three-turn spiral. And we can go into some more detail on that maybe uh, that later if we have a chance. But you can think of a donut as seven regions, seven little vectors chasing each other head to tail in a cycle. And they go around three times. They actually go through one, so you might want to call it four times, but there's no standard way to count that. So we've now identified the first verse of Genesis. It folds itself up into a donut. This is the bagel theory of reality. <laughs> <laughs> Second verse is more complex. Um, it also fits the same form, but it's a lot longer, and I didn't, couldn't sketch it without making a terribly complicated drawing, so I left it out. But in case you're wondering, third verse does the same thing. It's the third verse where God says, let there be light. And so it's appropriate to make a candlestick, a menorah seven-branch candlestick. Now, that's looking down the coil. Here we're looking down the coil this way. But here I've arranged it so it sort of laps on itself as you go around. And again, notice, all the letters pair up. This one's an odd letter, but it's symmetrical with this other two that are in the same set. In, in most cases, the letters are completely doubled up. And I have looked further into the text. The patterns get complicated very quickly, but there is evidence of that this kind of coding continues also. 
But this isn't the really, this isn't the, the, the densest pattern I could make. Now, why do I want a denser pattern? Well, let's go back and get a little context here. We're told that Hebrew, according to the Hebrew tradition, was a universal language before the Tower of Babel, that somehow there was an understanding of it that was universal. If you're going to do something that's universal, you have to pick the unique case in every instance. If there's more than one way to do something, then it's not going to be universal unless there's a clear choice. The choice that Mother Nature makes, that we've observed in doing our science, is to take the most compact, the most elegant, the lowest order. It's called Occam's razor. The idea is you don't want it to make a more complicated theory than you need to. And Mother Nature doesn't do that either. Nothing is wasted. This pattern um, has a lot of missing places where there aren't any letters. In other words, if it's eight, if it's eight fold symmetry, eight poles and seven turns, there could be 56 letters on there, 56 beads. I'm only using 28 beads. So I'm only using half the spaces. And even though this is sort of three-dimensional now, it's really still on a surface. It's still kind of a flattish thing. And we live in a three-dimensional reality. So the idea would be maybe there's a more compact form of that first verse that might eliminate some of those empty spaces that might be a higher-dimensional figure. And there is. Let's see if I can find it. Put it there somewhere. There it is up on top. Here it is over here. If you were to arrange the first verse on a cube with a vortex on each face of the cube, actually, you just follow it around, the letters are rolling, it actually starts here and comes up this way. You'd find that opposite vortexes are mirror images of each other. Now, there are still four spaces that are empty. That simply implies, if this is going to hold up, that this is really a higher dimensional object. And we're just still looking at if this is the three dimensional form. Maybe there's a four dimensional form which drops out those last four spaces. How many letters in that first verse? 28 letters in the first verse. 27 followed by the 27th letter. Well, that means that that first verse folds up into this object. This is supposed to be a representation of that. There's more than one way one can assemble it. In fact, it turns out this is a, also a donut. It doesn't look like a donut. Let me show you why it's a donut. The way you make a normal donut is you take a piece of paper, a square, typically, make believe it's a square, and you connect the left edge to the right edge, and then you have a tube, and you connect the top to the bottom, and you would make a donut, except I'll wrinkle my paper if I did it. That makes a donut in three dimensions, called a two torus. If you wanted to make a donut in four dimensions, you could take a cube and arrange it so as to connect this face to this, and this face to this, and this face to that. And that would be a donut in four dimensions, which we can't see except as shadows. So these are shadows. Well, that's how this is arranged. If you look through it, this vortex is the opposite of that one. It's as if this was brought around and pasted onto here. And this one is pasted onto there, and that's the projective space of a donut in four dimensions. And there's more than one projection of it. Here are two. These are made of the same pieces, but connected up slightly differently. And that's the way one looks. This is the way the other one looks. Put that back in the folder. And we're going to get back to those in a minute when we talk about what these all represent. So what have I found? I found that the first verse of Genesis folds up into this flower. Maybe I should tell you what it is. Um, one could call this a menorah. It's got a center point, which seems to light six little vortices, which look like flames. This little vortex looks like a flame. Where did the vortex come from? Oh, well, you just peel the seven color map off of the donut, and you have a little vortex. This is the def definition of the donut. You don't need the rest of the donut. Mathematicians don't need the dough. They just want to know what the surface is, you know, how it all fits together. Don't, donuts is not good. We'll get back to what that means in a minute. Well, let me just, just bring it down to, it, to the result now so that I can talk, talk about what it, all comes, what it all means, really. 
This guy is six of these little vortex.